Hey everyone, welcome back. I am the Electrical Code Coach. And in this video, we're gonna be in Article 230, learning all about service drops. We're gonna answer some common questions like, when do I have to use rigid metal? Or when am I allowed to use PVC? Am I required to go through the roof? Can I do it down below? And what is the minimum height for the wire going from my structure over to the utility? I am the Electrical Code Coach. Let's get to it. Hey everyone, welcome back. I am the Electrical Code Coach from electricalexamcoach.com. Let's get to it. Before we dive into the technical stuff, let's first learn what a service drop is. The service drop are the overhead conductors between the serving utility and the service point. So pretty easy to understand, the wires from the pole to the service point. But what is a service point? Our utility companies actually dictate where the point of service is, but the NEC does give us a definition. The point of connection between the facilities of the serving utility and the premises wiring. Your utility company dictates where it's at. They can say any place along this point. They can say here at the transformer where they're delivering the high voltage and transforming down to the house. They could say that it's over here on this swag pole as they're swagging over to the structure. More often than not, it's usually at the top of that weather head, at the top of the service riser. But there's nothing from stopping them from saying that it's down in the meter socket itself. And it's very important that we understand this definition because at that service point is when the NEC kicks in. And usually your financial responsibility as the owner kicks in from that point on in the event of the need of repair or replacement. All right, this is a perfect time for us to stop and have a little heart to heart. Because what I said could seem controversial at first, saying that the NEC doesn't kick in until you get to the service point, wherever that's at on this structure, according to the utility. But first, let's go back to the beginning of the code book and find out what the NEC does and doesn't cover. And let's answer the question, if the NEC doesn't kick in until we get into that weatherhead, why is my inspector concerned with the height of the service? In the beginning of the code book, it lets us know what it's all about and its purpose. In section 90.2a, it lets us know that the NEC is for the practical safeguarding of people and property from the hazards that arise when using electricity. It also let us know that it's not a design manual and it's not a manual for the untrained person. In part B, it goes on to say that in keeping in line with not telling you how to design it, that NEC installations are not always efficient, convenient, adequate for good service, or suitable for future expansion. These things should be considered when out in the field, but they're not a code requirement. The NEC is not here to tell you how to design it. Its only purpose is to fulfill 90.2a, which is to keep you practically safe, you and your property. When we get to part C, it starts talking about the installations that the NEC does cover public and private structures, yards, lots and parking lots, carnivals and industrial substations. Not talking about the utility, but an industrial owned substation. Equipment, mobile homes and floating buildings. I'm not gonna hit all of them. I've hit the highlights here of the installations that it does cover. Now let's look at part D and see what it doesn't cover. Part D lets us know that the NEC doesn't cover utility generation, distribution, energy storage or utility metering. Pretty much anything to do with distributing or generating their power is on them. But if they were to add parking lot lights at the power company, they would be required to get a permit and follow everything in the NEC. And the code that pins the tail on the donkey for us today is in 90.2 D5A. It says consisting of service drops, service laterals, and associated metering. So that says it plain black and white that the NEC doesn't cover the service drop itself. It starts at the service point and moves on. Now you might be asking the question, if that's the case, why am I concerned with the height of the service at all? Let me explain why. And for that, we're going to answer our first question of the day. Am I required to use rigid metal and go through the roof or am I allowed to use PVC? And for that one, we're going to head to our first code. 230.26, which is where we learn about the minimum height of the point of attachment. It reads like this. 
The point of attachment of overhead service conductors to a building or other structure shall provide the minimum clearances as specified in 230.9 and 230.24. In no case shall it be less than 10 feet above finished grade. First, let's unpack this code and then see how it beautifully weaves into the height of the service drop. The very first place that the overhead service conductors attach to a structure is called the point of attachment. Let's imagine in this scenario that our eave is 14 foot high and our 10 foot mark is at this height right here. Now the code says we can be at 10 feet, but we have to meet all these other height requirements that we're getting ready to learn about. But let's imagine that our service was gonna go up and we would meet all of those requirements. Well, in this case, we could use something like this. It's called a through bolt. You would just drill through the fascia, through the structure, put your washer and your nut on the back side, and you would be good to go. The utility would have something to attach to, you're meeting all of your requirements, and in that case, you would be allowed to use PVC under the eave. It saves a penetration through the roof, it saves lots of costs by not buying a piece of rigid metal and all the fittings that it takes to get the job done. Now let's take a look at scenario two. In scenario two, we're going to imagine that the eave is still 14 foot tall, but after we're done, the wire is going to droop down instead of up, and it's not going to allow us to meet our minimum requirements that we're getting ready to learn about. In that case, we would be required to go through the roof and have the point of attachment actually be on the metal pipe itself. We're going to use a fitting like this. It's going to wrap around the pipe. It's going to give the utility something to hook to, and the pipe could not be PVC. It would have to be rigid metal or some other approved means. Not PVC though. Just to recap, if we can meet all of our height requirements, we can have that PVC down below the roof and never penetrate it. But if we're not going to be able to meet our height requirements after the point of attachment, we have to go through the roof and raise it up a little higher. Let's get to it. Our original point of attachment code, 230.26, told us that that must provide the minimum clearances as specified in 230.9 and in 230.24. So let's check out 230.9 first. It says the clearances shall comply with 230.9 A, B, and C. Let's take a look at A. Service conductors installed as open conductors must have a clearance of not less than three feet from windows that are designed to be opened doors, porches, balconies, ladders, stairs, fire escapes, or similar locations. So we have to make sure that our final span is at least three feet off of any of these locations. Part B can be a little bit hard to understand just based off of reading it, so I've got a little infograph here and I'll explain what the intent of the code is. The vertical clearance span above or within three feet measured horizontally of platforms, projections, or surfaces that will permit personal contact must be maintained in accordance with 230.24, which is where we're getting ready to learn about some of our further height requirements for the actual drop itself. What it's saying is that we, if we have a platform projection or surface for three feet out from that surface, those heights must be maintained. And it's going to make more sense as we learn about the individual heights based off of our scenarios. Part C talks about building openings. It says overhead service conductors shall not be installed beneath openings through which materials may be moved. As in openings in farm and commercial buildings, they must not be installed where they can obstruct the entrance to these buildings either. So it's pretty practical. Now let's dive into 230.24. In 230.24b is where we get our minimum heights for overhead service conductors. This is if they do not exceed 1,000 volts. And remember that these distances must be maintained above final grade. So if you're on a project and the final grade is not set yet, you need to consider that. Scenario one is 10 feet minimum, and that's for areas or sidewalks that are accessible only to pedestrians. So let's imagine that in my photo, that's a sidewalk there. In this case, it would only be required to be 10 feet above that, as long as we met all of our other heights. That's if the voltage to ground does not exceed 150. Now that's not the voltage phase to phase, that's voltage to ground on any one of the lines or phases. So in this scenario, it would be true for 12240 and 12208, 
but would not encompass 277, 480. We're going to learn about those heights in the next point. In number two, it has to be at least 12 feet. And that's when we're on residential properties and driveways, as well as in commercial areas that are not subject to truck traffic. And you can work that out with your inspector. This applies where the voltages do not exceed 300 volts to ground. So all of these voltage classes would be encompassed because remember, it's line to ground or phase to ground. So it would include 12240, 12208, as well as 277480, or if you've got some odd voltages, as long as any one of those lines or phases did not exceed 300 volts to ground. Part three is really simple. It bumps it up to 15 feet. If we're in the areas that we just learned about in part two, but the voltage does exceed 300 volts to ground, it's going to kick it up, make it a little bit higher. And finally, we're going to kick it up to 18 feet when we're at public streets, alleys, roads, and parking areas where truck traffic occurs. Also over driveways that are not on residential property and over other types of land, including like cultivating, grazing areas, forestry, so on and so forth. So that's our heights that we're going to be dealing with most often, 10, 12, 15, and 18. If you happen to be going over a railroad, then it's going to kick it up to 24 feet. Well, there we have it. Even though the NEC doesn't kick in until the point of service, we found out that there are codes woven in to keep everything in harmony. And at the end of the day, it's really practical. If you're an installer, you want to make sure that you're doing installs that don't have callbacks. If you're the homeowner, you want to make sure that you're ending up with a long lasting installation. And if you're the inspector, you want to make sure that you don't look like an idiot and have a service ripped off the house a few weeks after you approve it just because it didn't meet those minimum heights after finished grade. I am the electrical code coach and my bargain is that these videos will add value to you and you will in turn add value to others. Let's get to it.